morning. Good morning. I'm Karen Mercer, the seminarian here at Sherwood, and I want to welcome you to the Sherwood Episcopal Church this Sunday, which is Sunday, October 10th. Hello to those of you who are present with us and those on Facebook Live as well. No matter where we are physically, just remember we are one body in Christ. As is our custom, we will have a few announcements at the beginning of our worship. For those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, please go, feel free to go to our website at SherwoodCockeysville.org. Click on the um, Worship tab. A drop-down menu will appear, and you can click on Bulletin and follow along with our service. We want to welcome the Reverend Joanne Tetralk today on, as our celebrant and as our preacher. Reverend Joanne is no stranger to Sherwood, and we are so happy to have her here worshiping with us and serving us while Mother Nancy is away. We will have hospitality following our service as normal. Hopefully the weather will cooperate. Um, we ask that you just please pick up your, um, your goodies outside. Have a little minute, few minutes of fellowship, if you will. If for some reason the weather doesn't hold up, we just ask that you kind of grab and go. Or if you feel the need to spend a few minutes inside to worship, maintain that six foot distance, mask as well. We want to make sure we do our parts to keep everyone as healthy as possible. I suggest that you please take a moment to read the additional announcements that are in the bulletin. And now if you would, just take a few moments as we kind of settle our minds, open our hearts to be able to hear God's spirit, to be able to hear that spirit move through us, through the hymns that we say, and sing and also through the scriptures and also as well through the prayers that we raise up. Once again, thank you for being here and welcome this morning.
may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. first reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help, the, to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 22, verses 1 through 15. We will read responsibly by whole verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are, and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Oh, oh my God, God not to cry in the daytime, and you do not answer night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. I am a worm and no man, scorned by all. All who see me laugh, laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and a roaring lion. is melting wax. My mouth is dried out, out like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. <laughs> According to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of summers ago, my husband Joe and I and some of his siblings spent a couple of weekends, long weekends, at their mother's house at the beach in Delaware. Of course, whenever there's a beach house, it is the summer vacation and holiday place for the family to gather, which in this case includes five grown children, two spouses, and four grandchildren. But this visit was different. This was not the typical how I spent my summer vacation story because mom was no longer there, taking up residence in the living room, always at the center as the family swirled around her. She died in 2017, and now we were there to begin cleaning out the house for good. This was no small task. She had lived there for 25 years. And so you can imagine it was chock full of possessions. Not only those related to 25 years at this house, but also with many, many relics from a past life at home in the DC suburbs. So it was all there. 
career mementos, books and games, photo albums galore, music, movies, sports stuff, kitchen stuff, gardening stuff, fancy tablecloths, and special occasion dishes of all kinds, clothes for every season, on and on. I see some heads nodding in recognition. Downsizing was not a concept that my mother-in-law embraced. During the first go-round of house purging, we decided to just focus on the garage for our own sanity. What came out were at least a dozen large bags full for recycling and trash and half as many again for the local thrift store. We made a good dent that day, but it was just the beginning. The funny thing was, we came across a folder full of magazine clippings with titles like Decluttering Room by Room, Why Downsizing is Good for Your Life, and Let Go of 100 Things in Less Than an Hour. Wow. Mom's penchant for organizing really did work in some way because the place didn't seem cluttered or disorganized at all. Yet once it was time to get rid of all these many possessions, they seemed to seep out of corners and carefully stacked boxes, decorative containers and drawers. The more stuff we pulled out, the more there seemed to be. We laughed to think that she kept those magazine clippings for us to find, knowing that someday we'd all be there decluttering room by room. I believe in her heart there was something that would be valuable or useful or meaningful to each one of us in each one of these things that we came across, each one of these possessions that made this house our family home. It wasn't so much an inability to part with things, so much as, I think, a desire to make us all feel thought of and loved and connected to earlier times, to better times, and also to connect her to her own sense of who she was. And I think there's something like that at work in today's story known as Jesus and the rich man. The man asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I've kept all the commandments since I was young. And Jesus delivers some startling news. You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and then you can come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The disciples, likewise, are shocked at this stark command, Jesus, look, we have left everything to come and follow you, our family, our livelihood, our homes. It's not too hard to imagine the disciples thinking, surely there must be some little trinket, some little memento, some little thing that we can keep in our pocket to remind us of the home we've left, something that we can hang on to to remind us of who we are and who we were. Because, after all, don't our possessions say something about who we are? Don't the things we own 
give us a sense of security? Don't our belongings say something to the world about how hard we've worked and how good we've been at what we do? Yes. And even in the ancient world, material prosperity was often seen as a byproduct of spiritual virtue. So how are we to give up all of our things to follow Jesus? Once again, his words make us uncomfortable. He makes it clear following him is not a walk in the park. As his disciples say in John's Gospel, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? I think what makes Jesus' words difficult is that unless we are very intentional, unless we really concentrate, we simply hear them in the context of our lived experience and our culture, that's just the way we operate. But that's not what Jesus intends. Remember how he said to Peter, you are setting your mind on, not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus asks us again and again to hear his words differently, to consider another way, to remember the kingdom of God is very near, even right here and now. But it is not of this world. Instead, it is this world turned upside down, a place where many who are deemed first will be last, and the last will be first. So let's take a closer look at some of the details in this story. First, it says, Jesus, looking at the man, loved him. I love that verse. He didn't scold him for having so many possessions. He didn't make judgmental comments or tell him how greedy he was. He simply told the man the truth. Only God is good. Yes, following the commandments is important. They instruct us on how to be in the world with others, about how to be community. But what the man lacked was an uncluttered reliance on God alone. All those possessions got in the way. They cluttered up his path. They kept his heart and his mind on human things. And even more than just the things, the belongings, the possessions themselves, but what comes with them. Striving for status, over-reliance on work and earning to obtain the next thing. Comparing ourselves to others, struggling with feelings of unworthiness or superiority. In biblical language, these might be called idols, things that get in the way or even replace our relationship with God. It's notable that in Mark's gospel, most of those who came to Jesus in a position of humility, kneeling, asking for a blessing, they tend to be extremely ill or demon-possessed. And when Jesus tells someone to go away afterward, it's generally because they have been healed. They're made whole. I don't think this is the case here. The man went away shocked and grieving, not healed. We don't know what happened to him. There's no next step in this story. We don't know whether he did 
what Jesus asked him to do, we're left to assume that he rejected Jesus' call. We're left to assume that the teaching is for us to look at ourselves and wonder, what is that one thing that we refuse to let go of? What is it we're holding on to that keeps us tethered to human things? I don't think it's a coincidence that in our lectionary cycle, this reading follows on this past Monday's celebration of St. Francis of Assisi. We know Francis not only had a wonderful way and deep communion with animals and the natural world, and he is also known to have taken a vow of poverty, a complete letting go of his need for power, prestige, and possessions, which must have been difficult because he was raised in a family of wealth and privilege. Yet in letting go of these, he opened the way in his life for a deep and abiding union with God. And that's what Jesus wants for his disciples, for us. That we can be rich in other ways besides having lots of things. So what would it look like to be rich with gifts of the Spirit, like patience, kindness, generosity, compassion? What would it be like to have the spirit of forgiveness, the gift of true happiness, the authentic desire to do good for others? What would it be like to have these be our most prized possessions? We did finally finish the job of clearing out mom's house completely. It wasn't easy, but it was a real, tangible way for us to reflect on her life and the life that we shared in that place and time. And along with the folder full of magazine clippings about decluttering room by room and why downsizing is good, we found something else tucked in her Bible that I think speaks to the notion of seeking more enduring possessions, to uncluttering the space between us and God. It's a poem attributed to Mother Teresa. It's commonly called, Do It Anyway, and it goes like this. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be serene and happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have. And it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. Because in the end, it is between you and God. 
It was not between you and them anyway. Amen. prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creator, creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all those lives, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We especially pray for those impacted by COVID-19, as well as those on our parish prayer list. Sandy and Jack. Virginia, Timothy, Margaret S. and family, Jackie and Rick, Lewis, David D., Caitlin, Alice, Shannon T., Marissa, Debbie R., Tom T., Bill P., Casey, Ron L., John C., Betsy, Kiernan and Colleen, and Lou D. 
Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the blessings of this life, including those celebrating birthdays, especially Sheila, Lauren, Don, Megan, and Bria, as well as their anniversaries. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God.
Christ our 